Okay, so I think let's get started. So my name is Stuart McMacken. Uh, I'm a business systems analyst in ITS who's been helping out on the FIS project. And with me on the call is my colleague, Kurt, uh, Kurt Griskonis, uh, who was a similar role and also a quality assurance engineer uh, also in ITS. So we're gonna split the duties today. I'm gonna run you through um, so the, some of the concepts on how recharge works. And then uh, Kurt's gonna take you through the tips and tricks and how you make sure that it verifies. So, uh, what are we going to talk about? Going to go over the, the basics one last time about miscellaneous cost import files and how those work. I'm going to look in depth at each field that you need to supply and what values you need to supply. We're going to talk about any tips and tricks that you needed uh, for submission. And then we're going to talk about how you can verify that your upload is there and uh, how, uh, how you can look for errors that you've got. Um, I'd ask that you uh, hold questions. We'll be asking for them as we go. Um, this is not a high-level basics class for the overviews on PPM or recharge. We've already provided those. And for the sake of the people who have participated in those before, uh, we're going to go a little fast over, the, over those parts. If you're not familiar with the basics here, uh, you can go to that link page that's linked. You can find recordings of those classes. We're going to record this class and we'll post it in the same place. And you can go back later then after you've seen those and watch this one again to your heart's content and hopefully some things will click into place for you that way. So let's dive right in. So the, the high level idea here, when we're talking about PPM, we're talking about project portfolio management. And it's really important that you understand how this fits in with the general ledger. So at a high level, we have uh, accounts payable, receivables, we have PATH, we've still got ISIS. Right? We have all of these various systems on campus that have transactions and record financial information. And they all post to the general ledger. So if you go into Oracle procurement right, and you purchase something, that registers as a payable. And it also, in addition to having a record in AP, has a record in the general ledger that reflects that transaction. And if you're trying to update the general ledger directly, right, you've got um, uh, an update that isn't going through one of these various systems, then that's where we use journal files. Uh, so a journal uh, updates multiple records directly in the general ledger. We've also got, oh, so at a high level, right, we could say we have sub ledgers, we've got ledgers, right? Uh, we also have PPM, which is a slightly different animal than those things. So PPM is definitely a sub ledger in that it definitely feeds into the GL. So everything that goes into PPM also ultimately goes to the GL. It's also sort of a ledger though, in that all of these other systems that get recorded also have to be able to push to PPM. So all of our capital projects, sponsored research projects and so on, all of those things are contained completely within PPM. So we wanna make sure that um, any transaction that needs to happen can happen against those. So for instance, when we talk about payroll, if we talk about PATH, if you're paying that person's salary against a chart string, that's going directly to the general ledger. If you're paying them against the project and task number, well, first that's got to hit PPM and then it hits the general ledger, okay? So in that sense, it is both a sub ledger and a ledger. And much like uh, the general ledger, it has this thing called a miscellaneous cost import file. So this is a file that posts directly into PPM. It doesn't go through any of those subledgers. It posts directly, okay? So this is the mechanism we're using for recharge. In our old world, in our ISIS world, when people needed to post the recharges, they were posting journal files directly to the general ledger. In our new world, we're trying to keep uh, journal access to the GL small. We're trying to keep the, 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 a thin general ledger so we're relying more on the subledgers. So we're doing the recharge operations inside of PPM. So your equivalent to the journal file to submit those recharges is that miscellaneous cost import file. It goes to PPM and then PPM pushes to the GL. So how does that work? Well, it has these key fields that it uses to be able to do that. You know, here are the POTAF fields. So what does POTAF mean? So P is project. O is the expenditure organization. E is the expenditure type. T is the task. 
A is the award, and S is the funding source. So it's a project. So that project is the project number that's receiving the expense, right? So you're billing something, what are you billing? You're billing that project, right? When you're submitting for the MCI file, you have to provide the project name or the project number, but you don't have to submit both. We would strongly encourage you always use the project numbers. Project numbers are never gonna change. The project names might. Those project numbers are gonna be seven digits. We're assigning them at creation when that project is created. We're never changing them, okay? The project is what's used to determine the entity, the financial unit, and the project field when we post to the general ledger. I'm going to show a slide uh, in a minute that looks at that in a little more detail. The O is misleading. So this isn't the organization that owns the project. This is the expenditure organization. So this represents who builds you, not your org. We know who your org is because it's on your project. We don't need to know that information when we do a billing. What we do want to know in a, in a billing is who builds you, which department generated this expense. So this stops you from having to do the detective work that we currently, or I guess I shouldn't say currently, that we used to have to do in IFAS, right? Where you have an unmatched journal line and then you had to go try to figure out where was the matching line to, for who built you. In one line, you can look at it and say, I know what I was built for, I know what got billed, and I know who billed me. And that who billed me question, that's the expenditure organization. The expenditure org must be the full name of the organization. It must be full and correct. Those names are the names of the financial units. So every financial unit also has an organization record in PPM. In the general ledger, those are numbers. In PPM, they're the names, but it's, one, it's a one-to-one -one match. Um, so what do we use these expenditure orgs for? Well, they're really for your convenience right, and for your customer's convenience if you're a recharge job. So they are able to look at it and see, you know, which organization built me for this. Or when you look at it, you can see who do we get this revenue from. At the current time, no accounting is generated based on these. Expenditure type. So this is the what did you get billed for, right? So this is, these are categories for expenses. They're basically the same thing as the chart of accounts account field, except one account in the chart of accounts could have two or 10 or 200 expenditure types in PPM. The example I like to use for this is office supplies. So in the general ledger, we just have one account for office supplies. But in PPM, we could make 30 different expenditure types for office supplies. If your office was tracking paper expenditures and they were really trying to track paper, well, we could add an expenditure type for paper. And every time they bought paper, you would use that particular expenditure type. In the general ledger, that's just going to post as office supplies, but then that gives you the ability to do more granular reporting. When we talk about recharge, we're giving an expenditure type to every recharge operation. So every operation has its own expenditure type. When those go to the general ledger, they're just going to show as recharge. They're all going to roll up to one account code because we don't need that level of granularity in the GL. But if you want to be able to do the reporting and say, well, for this expenditure type, you know, for this recharge op, what were my total transactions, then you can do that sort of reporting inside of PPM. And this expenditure type that's selected determines which account field gets populated. Okay, T is for task. So projects have tasks, right? They can have one task, they can have one less than a million tasks. Um, you can't bill just a project. You're always expensing a project and task combination. Say that again, because it's really important. Whenever you're recording an expense, you're recording it at the task level, never just at the project level. Projects can't receive expenses. Um, we, again, in an MCI file, when you're submitting it, you have to give the task name or the task number. You never have to give both. Again, I would strongly recommend using the number. They're not likely to change, but the names might. Task numbers are, are incremental whole numbers, one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. And the task field, determines the program and location. So if there is a specific building, then we'll have a CAN number for that location. If there's a specific program, like a UCY program, it'll be there. Um, and if this isn't a sponsored research project, it'll also determine the fund and function that get posted. What about if it's a sponsored research project? Well, then we have to use the award and funding source. So these are only needed for sponsored research projects. And the reason we need them is that if you were a PI, you're a faculty member on campus somewhere, 
Um, you might have a bunch of different pools of money that you can spend on the same research project. So you've got a grant from the National Institute of Health, and you've got a gift fund, and you've got the dean has given you some extra funding to support your research, right? So that means whenever you transact against that project and task, you also have to say which funding source is being used, okay? So every single time that anyone is transacting against a sponsored research project, every single time, they need the project, the task, and the funding source, always, okay? We can derive which award from the funding source, but we always need that funding source. That funding source is gonna determine which fund we post to the general ledger. The award is gonna determine which function we post to. Was this for education? Was it for research? Was it for administration, et cetera? Okay. So at a high level, all of these things answer a question, right? So the project field answers which project got expensed. Org says who expensed it. Type says what did they expense it for. The task, which task got expensed. And for award or funding source, which funding source are they using for this? Okay. Great. So how does this actually work, right? I've said that all of these things get, to, uh, get used to determine how it posts to the general ledger. Well, what's that look like? So you have projects right? Projects have names and numbers. They have that project owning org, right? Projects have tasks. The tasks have a name, a number, that fund, function, program, location field. And on that task, you get transactions. That transaction has an amount. It has an expenditure type, okay? On the other side, we've got the general ledger, right, with all the GL fields. So whenever something gets posted in any of the subledgers, not just PPM, there are these things called subledger accounting rules or SLAs. I think they should be called SLARs, but we call them SLAs, or at least Oracle calls them SLAs. So those SLAs are things that we've configured for our instance of Oracle Financial Cloud to say, hey, with the way that our subledger is configured and the way that our general ledger is configured, when you post to these fields, it should post this way to the general ledger. So the way we have it set up is we use that project owning org and that dictates which entity, which VC area, and which financial unit it gets posted to. We take that fund, function, program, and location field from the task. That's the fund, function, program, location. That one's pretty straightforward. That expenditure type tells me the uh, account, and the project number goes on the project field. You'll note the task number does not show up in the general ledger. There is no task field in GL. That is deliberate. It is not a level of reporting and granularity that is currently wanted in the general ledger. But we do post the project number field. Okay. Now, if it's a sponsored research project, we do it just a little differently. Same basic idea. You've still got projects, tasks, transactions. You've still got the general ledger, right? Um, we're still using project owning org to dictate the entity and the FINU. We're still using the tasks, program, and location for program and location. That expenditure type is the account. The project number is the project. But what's different is that thing I referred to earlier, where faculty members have multiple sources of funding they can pull from. And those are all tied to awards in the quality research system. So you have an award, and awards have funding sources. So when they select that funding source, we can ultimately use that to decide which fund gets used to post to the general ledger and which and the award dictates the function. Okay. Okay. So that's the POTAF fields, right? Project, expenditure org, um, expenditure type, task, award, funding source. But for those of you who are sending these fields in, you know there's a bunch of other stuff in there, right? And what do all those need to be? So let's run through these. So the first few here are all file type fields, right? So the transaction type for this is always going to be miscellaneous. The transaction source is always going to be UCSD manual import. Your document is going to say recharge. Mm -hmm. And then your document entry should be specific to your recharge operation. So when you get configured, they should give you a code for the document entry. Now, for those of you who are in some of our earlier trainings or were already submitting files, this is a little bit different from what we were doing before. That document didn't say recharge and we weren't doing specific document entries for every group. This is one of those lessons learned kind of things. 
So we want to be able to separate these things out and be able to see where did this come from, which system did this come from. So we're giving specific document entry values for every department and for every operation. These four fields should be the same every single time you submit a file. And there's no reason for this to change. It's going to be the same on every file, on every row. Okay. The next thing is the business unit. So it's important when you're submitting this that you tell us which business unit does this go to because they all have different books, right? That's a different ledger for campus than it is for Med Center. So you have to tell us which one does it post to. It's okay if you have multiple business units on the same file. Um, that, that's not a problem. If some of you may have encountered issues, if you're dealing with the API, it's been having some issues with this, with multiple business units. But Oracle itself doesn't really have a problem with this. It'll handle it just fine. Okay. So again, there are four business units there. Campus, medical center, population health, physicians group. This isn't your business unit. This is the business unit of the project that's receiving the expense. So if you are um, going to make up something I don't think we have. If you were operating a laundry operation, and that laundering operation supported custodial services and it supported the medical center, whenever you generated an expense, you would do one line for campus to say this is custodial services. You would do another line that said medical center for when you're doing med center. I guarantee you the chat is maybe telling you we actually do have laundry services. No, nope, not yet. Um, so we do have a question there about how would you find your own document entry code. So um, if you don't know, then that's a good place to put in a ticket right now and ask for it. If you're already submitting files, there's nothing stopping you from using the value you've always used. The system isn't going to reject it, at least not yet. Um, so if you don't already know what value to use and you've been using things in the past, that's great. If you don't, then you'll need to reach out. Okay. Um, expenditure batch. So every time you upload an MCI file, all of those records on that one file should have the same expenditure batch, right? Uh, and that expenditure batch needs to be unique across all of the expenditure batches across the entire university, across all of time. So the way that we're going to do that is when you put it in, use that document entry name that we've given you and start it with that. So if you're uh, housing and dining, Right? If you're HDH, it might say, you know, HDH and then the date and then a number. Uh, if you're going to submit 10 files in a day, then it's one, two, three, four, five. If you want to put a more specific timestamp and say this was, you know, September 15th at 10.02 a.m. and separate them that way, that's fine too. Whatever makes sense for you. As long as it's within your namespace, as long as you're prefixing it with your group, then people aren't likely to run into collisions here. If everyone's just typing in generic, you know, recharge, then we're going to run into some collisions and a lot of problems. Okay. Expenditure item date. So this is the date the expense occurred. That's not the day you submit it because we already know what day you submitted it. Right. So uh, in my fictitious laundry services example, if the customer um, requested a laundry pickup on uh, September 12th, and then you posted this on September 15th, well, then the expenditure date would be September 12th. So that's the date the expense occurred. And that date can be basically any time you want. It can be in the past as far back as you want to go, as long as that project and task was active at the time you were trying to send it. So projects have a begin and an end date. We're going to talk about this in more detail in a little bit. The projects have a begin and an end date. They have the tasks have a begin and an end date. Oracle verifies that your expenditure item date is within the time period when that project and task was active. So if you're recharging someone for a service that was performed two months ago and their project wasn't active two months ago, you will not be able to charge it. You'll have to ask them for a different project number. Okay? In terms of which accounting period it's going to post to, it's always going to post in the accounting period when you send it. So if you're sending recharges from two months ago, they're not going to post in the general ledger in the accounting period for two months ago. They're going to post at the current account period. But that expenditure date will be two months ago. And that way you can see when the actual service was performed. Okay. You also have to tell us how much, right? We've got to know how much we've got to charge. So there are four fields related to the amount. There's the quantity, which will always be the dollar value. Unit of measure, which will always say currency. 
transaction currency code, which is always going to say USD, and the raw cost in transaction currency, which is the dollar value again. Why are we asking you for the dollar value twice? Because if we had set up Oracle in some very different way, it would use quantity and raw cost for very different things. But it needs both. You have to send both or it doesn't work. So you're populating both of those fields. You're populating them with the same values. Okay. Last but not least, there is a field on there called unmatched negative transaction. This is the one that's been tripping people up. So um, if this is a negative number, this is a negative value, you need to put a Y on this field. Okay? If it's not, you can just leave it blank. But if it's a negative value, you have to put a Y on that column or else it will get rejected. This is a good place to stop and check for questions. Does, every, does anyone have any questions that they haven't posted in the chat? Hey, Stuart, um, uh, question about the project and tasks that are getting set up right now. Um, are they getting set up with a start date of July 1st or are they getting set up uh, with the start date of the day they're created? Um, I, they're getting set up. I don't know, actually. I think in the form when people submit it, they request the start date when people ask for a new uh, project to be created. I'm, I don't know the answer to that, Chris. Okay. Just, just curious. It's probably a mixed bag. Can, yeah. I guess the, maybe the question is, when you set up a project today, can you set the start date uh, to be yesterday, right, or two months ago? Oracle will stop you from doing that, yes. You could request that it be created with a, a start date from two months ago. That's not a problem. Okay. Yeah. If we have an organization that has multiple types of recharges, will we mm -hmm. use contact general accounting to set up multiple types of recharge names or identifiers so they'll need to set up multiple expenditure types for you and you'll want multiple projects for those for those different types of recharges um, but you don't necessarily need different document entries we it's fine to say these are all for the same department for document entry purposes we can okay. separate them out based on the expenditure type okay Stuart, it's okay. mike i just want a question for you your slide up here it says unmatched negative transactions i pulled up mm -hmm. my file that I've used um, a few times already and I don't see that column as a category was, and am I missing something here? Right, it was hidden in the version that we published originally um, which is part of why it's been problematic so if you show the hidden fields you'll see it. Gotcha got it hidden fields is there somewhere okay and yep. uh and uh and now that it's I know it's a new field I need to populate it with why if i um why yeah, would, it's a negative why, why it? sorry if you put a y on every single field it won't reject it it'll say okay but if you if it's a negative value without a y it will definitely reject it gotcha so can i just clarify then the idea is just go ahead and stick a y in that column on those fields mm -hmm. that's just, correct just because just because okay yeah it's because that's the way oracle works it's the wow factor. Yeah, you'd be safe to do that. And for those of you who've uh, moved on to more of an automated approach with the API, uh, the MCI builder does that automatically, puts it on every row. So you're, you're fine. You're, you're consistent with how the API works then. So I've got a few more slides. Turn I have a question real quick. Um, so I'm down at SIO and I actually work with two recharge facilities. And we recharge uh, fabrications, which are considered equipment per the award mm -hmm. budgets, you know, so it used to be sub four in the old days. And then we right. also uh, recharge non fab uh, items, which are, you know, sub three in the old days. So in the old days, we had a sub three account code and a sub four account code that we would recharge in this new system. Mm -hmm. How do we do that? Because I've only been given a 7700 code or whatever it is that, you know, that's basically only an operating expense. I don't know. So for questions that are that specific, I'm going to need you guys to go to office hours because we're going to try to cover all of the information that everybody needs. If you have questions about the content I've covered so far, if you don't understand what I've talked about so far, this is a good time to ask those questions. If you have specific questions like that one, you're going to want to send those to office hours. Okay, thank you. No problem. Sorry, I can't do it for you off the top of my head. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit more. Um, wait, I thought that I had the slides, uh, Kurt, for the recharge. 
configuration and how, how we set that up. Did I not have those? Hold on real quick. Maybe, maybe not a previous version. Just want to make sure we didn't lose that. No, it's not on there. Okay, let me pull up another slide deck real quick, folks. Sorry, we're going to audible here on the fly just for a second. But I do want to make sure we all have the same context. Um, so this is coming back from the slides from the original thing. I thought that we had inserted them into the slides, but it looks like I messed up. Um, so the part here that we want to talk about is for these recharge operations. Right? So each recharge operation is a project. So it's a separate project within your department. Your organization might have 10 different recharge operations. That's great. Let's set up a separate project for each one of those. Inside of that a recharge operation, that you might have different tasks that you need to represent the different lines of service within that recharge op. So if your recharge op is, uh, if your department is health and safety and your recharge operation is hazardous waste, one of those tasks might be battery pickup and another one is miscellaneous waste and another one is acids and whatever the various lines are there that they want to drive, right? And then we have an expenditure type for every one of those recharge operations that you're going to send when you record your expenses. But when you're looking on your side, you can say, I look at my project and this shows me for this recharge operation, my overall, all my expenses for it. And then if you want to know for each one of those lines, you can split, split those out by task as it's convenient for you. Okay. Because all of our recharge operations projects, then all of our customers have to be built through projects as well. Those customers can be built through any type of project. So if it's a sponsored research project or a capital project or anything, it doesn't matter, right? You just need that project number and task number. If it's a sponsored research project, remember you also need the funding source number. So they have to tell you which one of their funding sources they're using. If your customer doesn't have any projects, so we ran into this a lot with surplus sales, Right. So the English department goes to surplus and says, hey, I want to sell these desks. I don't really use projects. Well, they do. They just don't know it. So we've created something called the default project for every financial unit. So every financial unit on campus has at least one project. It's all, they all start DFLT, DFLT, and then the FIN unit number. And then they have two tasks. They have one task. The task one is for recharge. Okay. So if you have a customer who doesn't have projects to give you, then you can always look them up. If you know their FIN unit number or they know their FIN unit number, it's DFLP and their FIN unit number. That's the name of their project. And you can use that for recharge. Okay. Um, so when you're re processing a recharge, then you have two sides to this, right? You have your service provider, you have your service receiver. So there's two lines that are gonna come through here. You have one line that's the expense to the receiver. I'm your customer, I'm gonna look on my side, I'm gonna see an expense, right? So in the example that we've got here, this is the VCHS Core Bioservices Group, and they're billing a sponsored research project for services. So $5,000 from Core Bioservices for tissue culture, right? Line number two is that quote unquote revenue. I'm putting air quotes on revenue because this isn't money coming from outside the university. All right, this is money happening inside the university. From an accounting perspective, this is not actually revenue. Um, we call it recharge income, right? There's a phrase that we're using here. So that recharge income coming back. So what's that look like? So that's $5,000 from biological sciences for that recharge income, okay? So if I look at what those lines look like on my MCI file, right? Now we've got all those other fields, but these are my poet lines. I've got my projects or expenditure type and task, right? I've got those core four lines. That first line is the customer project. It's the customer task, but it's your expenditure work because when the customer looks at their spends, they need to see who billed them. That's you, right? And that amount is a positive value, a positive expense. When you look on that second line, it's your project, right? Your recharge operation project, and it's your task. That expenditure org is their department. Who got, who did I get money from? I got it from biological sciences. The expenditure type is that recharge income account. And then that amount is a negative expense. That's how we're pushing money back into you for recharge income. It's a negative expense. 
Okay. So when we talk about how do the recharge operations work, right? Every recharge op is a project. You have different tasks on those and you've been issued your own expenditure type, right? And then you need to know the project number, the task number, and in some cases, the funding source number of your customer to be able to charge them. Okay, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Kurt and he's gonna run us through some of the common errors that people are seeing and some of the tips, tricks we can use to deal with those. Kurt, would you rather have me continue to push it through or do you wanna share? I can share. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Stuart. And I'll go ahead and share. So I'll be going through tips and tricks and some of the uh, common errors that happen. And then we'll open it up to questions. Okay. Let's see. Okay, so here's some basic tips that'll, that'll help uh, prepare a, a good file that won't be rejected. And, um, and I'll explain in a little, a little bit about how files can be um, rejected at two different points in the process. Uh, so we have to make sure that uh, any, of the, any of the expenditures that you're importing, that the uh, expenditure item date the, the date of that expense is within the project uh, task start and uh, end date. It's actually really completion date. And we, we found out recently, um, it used to say here that the status had to be active, but it can actually be active or inactive in the fact that if you're, let's say, posting this month for an expenditure last month and that project and task is uh, no longer active, but you still can post an expense this month that has an expenditure date of last month. So the only time you cannot do that is when the status of the project is UCSD closed. So that's basically like a, uh, a hard close. Uh, the other situation is kind of more like your bank account is left open um, when you're closing it down, your checking account, and you could still have your checks honored uh, until uh, you, know, you, you pull out all your money in the end and close it, close it down hard. Um, so tasks also have their own set of beginning and completion dates, and um, they're usually aligned with the project uh, completion and end dates, but they can be uh, different. They can be within those dates. I actually haven't seen that use case yet, but it does uh, allow for that. And then uh, if you need to record an expense that occurs outside the project dates, then uh, you may need to request a new project and task number uh, to, to receive, to be able to receive the expense. So there's some tips there. Now there's this concept called project transaction controls and um, it, it's uh, something, it, basically it's like a set of business rules that, uh, that the PPM has built within it. And uh, one of the, important ones is to, is to make sure that the expenditure type is correct. And um, so for instance, not all expenditure types are allowed for all types of projects. And when I asked Marissa about this, the one example she could provide was that the uh, sponsored, for sponsored research, alcohol is not an allowable expense on sponsored projects. Um, and there's other parameters that are managed by transactional transaction controls too, but I need to fill this in um, later because even I'm learning about these myself. So this is a big complex uh, set of functionality and, and we're all learning. So there's some additional uh, factors to consider for sponsored projects. And uh, before you submit your files, you need to make sure that in addition to those project and task dates that the budget period dates are, um, are, 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 you know, that your, your expense is within those dates. And that um, there's also control budget dates. And then of course the, uh, the contractor award dates that align with uh, what, what uh, 
the award is set up or the research uh, sponsored project is in Kuali, which then gets uh, propagated down into Oracle. And then uh, we have this, uh, this is something I actually need to double check with Marissa, but my understanding is that the project end dates uh, cannot be changed once they're set. So I need to double check that and we'll make sure that this uh, is, is uh, up to date when I send it out. But uh, I was updating this just even moments before this presentation today. So my apologies for that. Um, back budget period dates cannot be backdated once they're sent. And so, you know, getting the dates right is very, very important when submitting your files. And then the award end date will also stop transactions from posting. Um, but we are able to manually adjust the end, the end date to a future or past date for those. So I put this together because, um, and this might even benefit some of the folks that have been involved with uh, submitting through the a an API. Um, you know, we the process is 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 a bit lengthy. Um, the the files come in either through a manual load or through an API, and they do all come in in the standard Oracle format. Um, there is no uh, exception to that. You know, it has to be in with all the right columns and and uh, formatting and everything. And the first thing that happens is a syntax check. So that syntax check will verify that uh, like date fields are properly formatted and Oracle's pretty fussy about that. Um, it won't take any, just, just any date format. It has to be year, month, and day. Um, is a, a numeric field, does it have non-numeric values in it? So that's the kind of syntax check, check that's performed. And if it fails the syntax check, it doesn't even get into the staging tables at all. So then um, messaging comes back and uh, to, to the submitter to correct the errors and they have to correct the, the source file again and resubmit it. Now, once a um, file is actually uh, passes all the syntax uh, checks, then it gets loaded into the interface table here. Now, when it gets loaded to the interface table, it doesn't automatically get submitted per se. It, uh, you have to do the next step, which is to, this is the load process here, and then this is the import process to get it into PPM. And so there's another uh, program that, that's run inside of Oracle uh, that makes that happen. And during that point is when a data validation check is performed. So this is where things like um, it validates that your your projects are are valid, um, and are they in are they in the uh, are they active, um, are they not in UCSD closed status, are your uh, are your dates on your expenditure uh, item dates are they within the range? So it does a lot of uh, validation um, to 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 make sure that once it gets into PPM that it is a fully valid transaction. If that gets rejected, it, it stays in the import, I'm sorry, the, the staging table, but then it goes into an error status. And, and there's two ways to clear that error status. One is to actually go in and update the transaction in the UI, which there are not a lot of people that can do that, uh, mostly like the OPAS team or folks that have access to do uh, you know, read write activity in PPM. Um, General accounting now has that too because they're actually the team that is processing the snow tickets uh, for you folks out there that are new to this and don't have um, you know, the IT resources haven't set you up yet to, to, have, uh, to be able to do a load via the API. <clears throat> then they, those uh, transactions need to be, like I said, they can either be imported I'm sorry, corrected in the UI and resubmitted, or they can be purged from the table and then resubmitted um, from the source again. Th those are the two ways to do that. And then once the, uh, the data validation is performed and everything passes, then they uh, get correctly or fully loaded into PPM and the cost is recorded and then they can continue on uh, to then post to the GL uh, 
to the general ledger uh, and then record that part of it financially. So those are the two uh, failure points. Now that's relevant for the folks that are putting together these files manually because, um, and I, have a, I actually have a, a sample to show you where um, Oracle is not even the smartest about how it does the syntax uh, error check. It, it actually, if you have two errors in, in the same file in two different columns, it'll catch the error in column one first and then you'll get a rejection for that reason. You fix it and you resubmit it again and it'll tell you the next error that's, that's there. So if you have four different errors in four different columns that are all syntax errors, then, then they get, um, you, have to, you iterate through that. So that's why we've got to try to have really clean files if possible. Now, I talked with uh, Seho before we put this together and talked to him about, well, what are the most common errors that your team is seeing? And, and kind of along with that theme that we talked about before, the expenditure item date is after the award date, if it's a sponsored project. Um, the task is an active as of the expenditure item date. In other words, the expenditure item date is like this month and the task expired last month. Um, or the expenditure item date is outside the project dates. It's kind of the same thing. Um, there's also this uh, issue with the ward budget period uh, uh, issues where it's not derived for the budget date. And, and even some of this, I'm, I'm still getting my mind around, um, but, you know, so I have to appeal myself to uh, Marissa, the expert sometimes for uh, help on this. Um, but then uh, we also have the transactions fail budget checks because the budget date isn't within the control budget date range. In other words, budget dates are, budgets have to be active during for the uh, expenditure date that you're recording it for. That's really the bottom line. Now, the thing about it is that some of these errors, they cascade and make other errors appear more complex than they are. Um, yeah, I actually took it out of there. There's, uh, let me see if it's further down. I think I moved it right before. Yeah. I move that. So um, if the, wh where it comes up is if the, uh, if, if you put an expenditure date in that is not within the project dates and the task dates and the award dates, you'll get an error for all three for the same record. So you'll see the error three times. So that's, that's when it looks pretty bad. Um, and, but, and, and con confusing, especially if you're a recipient of the error report the first time, you know, the first time you've seen it and you go, oh my, my gosh, look at all these errors I have. So it can be quite daunting. Now, um, let's talk about some of the common syntax errors and then these data validation errors and I'll show you samples of them. So um, let's talk about like the date not formatted correctly. So it needs to be year, month and day um, and any other format will cause a rejection. Uh, another thing that can cause a rejection is if a required field is missing in the file. So let's look at what that would look like actually in Oracle. Okay. <clears throat> so while Stuart was speaking, I was loading a file and uh, let me actually show you the file itself. Give me one moment here. Okay, so for those of you that are doing snow tickets right now and getting used to this um, template, um, you know, you're familiar now with, uh, or at least been exposed to updating these different columns here and learning along the way. Um, but when I first submitted this file, I actually uh, had this in a different format instead of the correct format. And it looked like this. Let's see, what did I have here? 
yeah, I just had the most generic one there. That's what it looked like the first time I submitted it. So let me show you what that looks like in Oracle. So, okay. Yep. Oh, I need to uh, search by just my user name because we have other folks that are out there testing. Oops. Let me back up here. So I'm searching just using my uh, user ID. Okay, so the very first one that I did um, is, is this one here that I loaded the file. And when, when I actually imported it manually, um, it zipped it up and put it in CSV format. So, so for those of you that have been doing, uh, doing that part of the process, you'll see, now you'll see why it has you do that. And so it's, it's the same as the version you'd been working with, but it doesn't have column headers. Um, and it's a CSV format. Now, let's see here. Okay. Da, da, da. Oh, this is the second one I did. Um, I actually made this non-numeric here. So I, I went out of order here. Sorry about that. Well, we'll go ahead and go with this one here. So um, this, this one also had an error. It had, I'd already worked through and corrected the, uh, the date error, but um, let me look at the log here. It'll actually tell me what was wrong with this particular file. Yep, long, difficult to read. Okay, yeah, this is where it was, it called out that the, uh, the, the format string is incorrect for the expenditure item date. So uh, I had to look at the log file to figure that out. And there is a file here called bad text, but I found that it's uh, not very useful. Now, again, for you folks that are submitting via SNOW, the people that are uh, behind the scenes in general accounting that are helping you out, um, they'll be doing this very process that, that I'm doing here. Um, and hopefully not very often, but see, this doesn't really help a whole lot. Um, so then I said, okay, I went ahead and I, I, I corrected that and I loaded it again uh, with the correction. And uh, then I went ahead and submitted it. And then when it was actually trying to load it to the interface table, that's when the warning happened. And that's where we see the log file. And in this case here, um, I had corrected the date format, but then remember, remember I had that, uh, that uh, $66, uh, the very first line had the, uh, I, I put uh, alpha zeros instead of um, zero. So what happened there is it, it rejected it because it's, an invalid number. Now only one record got rejected here. And that's one thing that's very important to know here is that you can have um, the good records get through and import and the ones with errors at both stages fail and, and, and be left behind. So, so one, one, one failed and then the other five went ahead and moved on and, and they, at least they made it to the interface table. Okay. And then, oh, and what's interesting about this one too, is that th this is the job that loads it to the, that, you know, that I use to manually load it into the import table. And then Oracle, it spawned this job transfer file, and then th this load file to interface. 
So that's, I had to look at this one to look at the log file to see what the error was. But back here, the parent job errored out. And what I have here is a bit of a gem in the fact that, uh, oh, there, it's not there. Hmm. Okay. I think I must have, oh, I, I did, the, the, sorry, I did one more correction. I did correct the, uh, the syntax error. And I made the $66 with the zeros instead of uh, alpha, alpha O's. And then I went ahead and I loaded that. So one more time, um, this is the, uh, the file again, the zip file again with the, the corrected uh, data. And this time it, it got through, it succeeded. It, it loaded to the, uh, to the table. And so, Right now, um, it's literally, well, it, it, it loaded to the table, but it, it hasn't been imported yet at this point. So um, let me go back here. So when I look at the point where it does the, uh, it tends to load it into the final tables, then I look at the reports there. And there are two reports that get generated. Uh, this, this one here, and I'll make it bigger so that you all can see it. Um, actually, okay. Now, it still says we have nine errors. Now, this report doesn't generate until at least it gets loaded in the interface table. And so we've got nine errors. And of those nine, again, we, remember we only had, I think six records. So no, we had nine actually. But um, one of the problems is that the project number didn't exist and it doesn't have a valid project ID. So it's a bad project number. Actually, that was true for three of the records. And then um, for all six of them, I didn't have a unique batch name. So that is where this column here, expenditure batch, which has got a star on it, which means that it's required, it's missing that entirely. I did that on purpose. And then um, this is a new one for me and it's kind of throwing me off about a person doesn't exist. Well, there really should be nothing in here that is about people. So. That's something that if I would look at if I were processing this myself. It, it's kind of unusual. Sometimes Oracle does a head fake on you and it'll tell you one error when it's really related to something else. Um, so that's, that's what happened there. But because this one had um, project numbers that weren't even valid in this, this uh, test environment in Oracle, um, it, 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 it actually rejected those straight up. And what happened is that it created this spreadsheet here, this unprocessed miscellaneous cost spreadsheet. That's not it there. It's uh, oh, why is it doing that? Ah, okay, sorry, it, it is the right one. So because these are uh, fairly egregious errors, um, it, it actually uh, created this file for me so that I could zip it back up and re-import it. Uh, I actually forgot about this. When, when it's something like the project isn't valid or you're, you're, you're missing uh, a, a key, uh, uh, that data that is required, it actually will not load it into the interface table. I forgot about that. So, so even this one here, it only produces this file if it doesn't get loaded into the interface table. So this, I would have to go correct the errors and make sure that my project is valid. Maybe it got keyed in and maybe it was really project 513, not 514. Um, and then I would definitely need to make sure to put in the, um, the, the expenditure batch as well for these, 
these here. Okay. Oh, now I see what happened. Um, this was the file I loaded, but when I did the import, um, I picked up three three other records because I was um, not granular enough in how I submitted it. But yeah, so so these all have to be fixed and would then have to be uh, re-imported by uh, your your Snow uh, ticket uh, helper, I guess. I'm not sure even what to what to, to call them. All right, so. I don't actually have one that I personally processed um, that is an error status that got loaded to the table and just waiting to be corrected. So I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna go to a, uh, a screen that only um, like the old pass team and, and general accounting and a few other folks that have PPM access have access to, but there are ways for you to get this data even if you are, uh, you don't have that kind of access and that's through reporting, which I'll show you in a moment. But I, I went in here to the uh, the cost screen within PPM and there's an, a section here for exceptions and each one of these transaction sources document IDs um, has a number of exceptions out here. Again, this is a test environment, so be not afraid if, uh, if any of these particular areas is yours. Um, and it's a test environment, so it's kind of slow. Plus there's a lot of records out here that it's trying to retrieve. And I actually have to wait for that spinning to stop. Of course, because I have many people watching. So I'll go ahead and, and uh, do this part here. Um, so for the folks that are submitting via snow, and I really don't know what the distribution is in this meeting. I, I think it's, it's more than half. Um, if there's error in your files and the person that's uh, helping you out in general accounting that's submitting these experiences errors, and I think Seho Tan's team is helping out with that as well. Um, you know, they will let you know uh, via your snow ticket and maybe even via email what the errors are and, and ask you to correct them. Um, and then you would submit them back and then they would um, continue on and try to finish the, the import. Once they're successfully imported, then your ticket will close. <clears throat> For those of you who are further along and you uh, submit by an API, um, you're probably already familiar with the logs and reports, uh, some of them that I've shown you. Uh, some of them get emailed to you actually. Um, in fact, all the service accounts associated with the APIs should be receiving emails with zipped up logs and um, reports associated with each step of the process. And uh, some of you have been granted to temporary access to go in and view the reports real time like I was just showing you, but long term, that is not um, the intent to keep that in place. There are BI reports available to confirm if your uploads have occurred uh, and, and look at the exceptions. So we'll go through that in a moment. And okay, so I'm gonna go in here to UCSD manual import. I'm gonna click on this one just because it has um, less than these big numbers here, okay. So these are in error status. They have um, different issues probably. And again, these errors are available on uh, in the reports as well. But this particular first record, which is in the interface table in error status, it says you must provide the raw cost debit account if the raw cost is accounted uh, externally by a third party application. Well, of course, I chose one that I didn't have in our list of common errors. Um, you actually don't need to provide the raw cost debit and um, credit accounts. This is for a different type of um, MCI import. So I'm gonna actually get out of here because uh, this is not a recharge. I'll go into one that, that's a recharge and just take a chance that, uh, I know that um, ITMCN is a recharge. So I'll go ahead and I'll open that. Okay, so these should be recharges and we'll see 
yeah, the award budget period wasn't derived for the budget date. So um, that expenditure date is probably not within that budget period. Let's see if that's the case here too. Yeah, you can't charge to the project because the charges aren't allowed from the provider business unit to this project. Well, this could be a situation where a project was used um, that was for maybe the med center and then it was attempted to be imported using the business unit for campus. Um, so that would be a correction that would be made there. And anyhow, um, there's other errors in here too. So this is what the folks behind the scenes will see uh, on your on your behalf when they're working through these errors. Um, hopefully you don't have very many of them. Let me go back here to the presentation. All right, so let's look at each of the uh, objects available here. So the first few are reports um, and these would be only for if you had successfully imported and um, let's say if I click on this one here, actually, I'm not gonna do this one because there's something I'm doing wrong in there and um, Marissa gave me some guidance on it and, 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 and it's not working for me. So I'm gonna do the one that does work for me and that's this one here. This report is actually from production, which I think I logged out of by mistake. Okay. Well, I should be able to just go there now. So this goes into Oracle BI Publisher. Uh, you need to have obviously Oracle access with the reporting capability to be able to use this report. Um, but BI reports are more available than say getting into the UI report uh, that I was just showing you. And so here, you know, you can put in any number of criteria uh, to be able to, to run the report. And I'm just, I'm gonna go back to uh, my slide because I'll go into presentation mode so it's easier to see. And so what I did is um, I went and I looked at, yeah, this was uh, the transaction sources, UCSD Maximo. That that's what I, I I ran this report for, and it and when it when it created it, um, you know this is the format that it created it. So actually, I don't think that's bad. Um, I thought it would have less time. So let me. I'm going to go here, and I'm going to um, search for Maximo. And that first search just populated that field. Any other field you want to do here, like I'll do the, the date range of September 1st uh, through today's date. I know they're posting out there. I've seen them posting. And uh, that should be enough. Then I'll click apply. This may take a moment. Um, so let's do reality check here. Am I am I too slow, too fast? Is this a value to you folks? Do you have any burning questions while I watch this process for a minute? Oh, don't get quiet on me. Ask that same question a different way. Kurt knows how knows the ins and outs of this. Do you guys have any questions for him on common errors that you're sending? Thank you, Stuart. 
I'll alert you to one uncommon error. Evidently, we had a couple spaces after a, a name in our thing, and that took a few weeks for us to figure out what the error was. So look for spaces in your naming. It's a computer. It doesn't like any characters, including spaces. Yeah, that's so funny. Uh, Marissa emailed me that just like an hour before the meeting to ask me to include that. And, and yes, I personally have had that issue when I was first working with this import early on in the project. And I struggled with that quite a bit. And nobody here had really done this import yet. So um, it was it was quite a struggle. I have been through your pain. It was just well before you have, <laughs> if you're having pain now. I'm not going to assume you are, but OK. So hopefully this should, maybe my date range was smaller before. OK, let me go ahead and back to the slides while that runs. OK, yeah, again, this is one that will tell you the ones that made it all the way. And the next one is a, um, ah, I know what I can do. While this runs, I can go back to the UI. Oh, that's actually, yep. I'll go back and I'll go into production again. And I'll go into project costs. Oh, there it is. It's opening that Excel file. Because when this report ran, it, it went ahead and it just spit the output out as uh, that particular reports uh, configured to just go ahead and generate the Excel file. Sorry, it's uh, it's fussing a bit because I have other I have other spreadsheets open. Oh, I hope you don't hear all that chiming I'm doing there. And if you did, I apologize. Hmm. Kurt, did you ask if there were any unanswered questions? I know that I've seen Stuart in chat answering as many questions as possible. But maybe while you're waiting for that, um, Stuart, were there any? Did you? Yeah. Really Go ahead. Get Thank you, Anna. Yeah, because I'm not watching yeah. the chat at all. Yeah, I, I think we. Yeah, and I think Stuart was managing it pretty well. But um, in case we missed anything, I just want to take the opportunity to. No, make that's the most perfect. Of Thank you. Time. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, well, that's actually been covering a bunch of them also, just to give credit where it's due. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I think we've got things covered. Uh, the one thing that people are asking for that I don't think we have a good version of right now is the most up-to-date uh, version of an MCI file to use as the template. So, um, Kurt, if we want to find a, uh, a pristine file that works really well and ship it out to people and say, hey, use this as your model, that might be a yep. good thing to do. Yep, I, I, I sort of have an evolving version of that, and I can definitely uh, provide that. No worries. Yeah, so finally the report uh, came up here. So in the date range of 9-1 to the current date, these are all the cost transactions that did successfully import for this transaction source of Maximo. So if you were looking for your particular, say, batch that you just uh, imported, then you would want to uh, look at the expenditure batch. It's not on here. This is a report I did not use until today myself. I have another one that I use. Um, interesting, that's not on there. Yeah, it is. Okay. Yes, uh, it's Marsha. Hey, it's in that original transaction reference. The first uh, four letters is our batch number. So that's all I know. And the oh, rest is yeah. the work order and all that. Yeah, but that is actually a separate column. But, um, okay. but, but that's, oh, a, that's a good point. Yes, it is actually, yeah, yeah it is. Um, interesting. Okay. Well, um, let me move on to the next one. Oh, I was just looking on that report that I just learned about today, <laughs> um, where, where the expenditure batch was, because that's one of the, 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 like the main things I use to go search up uh, a batch of uh, imports that I do. Um, and 
I, I don't see it in this report. It's in another report that I use, which I can also share with the team. Um, in fact, I will in the um, the post uh, meeting uh, place wherever we share. Yeah. All right. Let's let's not get stuck on that. That is a valuable report, though. Um, so then the next one here is if you wanted to see your imports that failed validation. So um, let's say that you're you're getting kind of uh, pretty good at at submitting really clean files via your snow tickets and and uh, you, you want to learn more about this and, and look at the errors yourself. You could do this, or if you're an API user, you would certainly uh, uh, possibly use this. So let me do the presentation from here. So th this is another BI report that you can run. And the thing about this one, when it, when it actually creates it, um, it, it does it as a PDF here and you, you have to download it as an Excel. So what you do is you just click this little um, icon here and download it to Excel. And then what I do end up doing is I end up just cleaning up the formatting myself. Would you want to download the CSV file? You can do that too. Yes, you can download CSV as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's difficult to reformat it and download CSV file and then you know save it as an Excel file. Mm -hmm. Probably will be better. Yep, I've done that before myself. So yep, you have the option to do either one. And uh, so this is where you would want to go look for. Um, you know, your transactions that failed. And let's see. Yeah, I actually um, did not keep that particular one open, but um, yeah, so that's, that's available to you. Also, um, if, if you are uh, one of the folks that does have this, uh, this managed project cost access inside the UI and PPM, um, this is what it looks like. Uh, I'll just actually do a quick search there. I did save a batch. And this is where I like to use the, the, uh, the batch ID. Um, so here I am in, in production. I have to recenter myself from time to time. And so, uh, so the, the expenditure uh, batch is actually not showing here. So in order to see it, you have to click on advanced. And what I like about this is it gives you a lot more you know, if you're a user that can get in here, you probably already know, but you, you can see a lot more here um, than you can on the basic page. So uh, I'll put in the, uh, the batch. And the reason I have to do contains is because Oracle actually concatenates additional information. That took me about three days to figure out early on. Our consultant had to teach us that. Okay, so this is the, uh, this is the online UI of all these costs that have been successfully imported. And I've tailored this to my liking. Uh, it's not the out of the box view. Uh, for instance, I put like created by here because I like to see uh, the name of the service account usually that, that submitted it. Um, you've got your project number, name, task, task name and, and so forth, uh, as well as your document, document entry, um, and transaction source here, your, your costs and, and all that. Um, and interestingly, yeah, this particular batch, I'm only seeing the positive side. So I'm going to pull up another one here. It's going to look more palatable. Okay. 
Um, they're not aligned like like the way you see in the file of the debits and credits. Um, it, they're, they're, I'm, I actually haven't figured out how to sort it that way um, in the UI here, but you, you can see um, some of your, let me uh, actually expand. So your credits are the negative values and then your debits are the positive values. If but you sort by are, transaction number, it'll, it'll. You know what? I tried that earlier. Thank you, though. Is that Richard? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Richard. OK, more like how we're used to seeing with your, your credits and your debits and your amounts. Uh, being negative and positive. So, yeah, thanks for that. Okay, you get a Snickers. Okay, so that's how it can be seen in the UI. Um, let's go back here. And then I already showed you how we can see the errors that are in the import table in, in the import error status. Yeah, okay. Okay. Now I'm opening it up for Q&A. What have, what have we not addressed from the chat first? Is there anything we have not addressed or that Stuart has not addressed? I think we hit everything on the chat. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you for handling that. Okay, no folks. Um, I'm sure a few of you have a couple of questions here and there. I think somebody had asked a question about how to um, deal with documentation, so like a recharge receipt. Uh, Oracle does not, as far as I know, I haven't seen any place where we can link to a recharge statement. Do you know if there might be that capability in the future? No, it doesn't drill through the way that you're used to. Um, you can put a reference number on the MCI file, and then people could use that reference number to go back to your source system and look it up. But that's the best we can do. Got it. Anything else? Well, I had asked another question in the chat. I kind of knew the answer, but I asked because I wanted to see if, um, what your experience is. So when we have been uploading MCI files, we find that usually within a minute or so, we can go in and we can actually see those costs already in PPM. So I know it depends on the number of transactions that you have in your MCI file, but in general, I find that it's pretty fast. So do you wanna comment on how long you've seen it take? Um, I, I, I've generally experienced pretty fast. Yeah. Um, I've seen other imports that take much longer, um, but usually minutes as opposed to many minutes. Um, it, it, it really all depends on your file size. And I know that some of the folks using APIs are pushing like thousands of transactions in, in some cases. And no, don't worry, we'll never make those of you out there that are doing this manually on snow do that. <laughs> I can't imagine that your areas have that many. Um, or do we have anybody out there that's doing that many right out of the gate manually? Okay, that's a good thing that you're not. Okay. Yeah, um, so uh, your question in the chat. So the API is a programmatic interface. So if you have programmers that uh, are available to write code that could submit your recharges for you, then they can request access to be able to do that. Um, Kurt, can we uh, find them the link for the API request access request, or is that just a snow ticket at this point? Uh, yes, um, actually, I will. I will. Uh, do you want that now? Let me see um, if it's in I the remediation it's guide. Perfect. Go ahead. Yes, please. Okay. Kurt, I'll put it in the chat. Oh, say ho? Yep. Glad you're here. Thank you. No problem. Yes, say ho and I have 
partnered on many things uh, to do with these APIs, not just this one, but others too. Uh, yeah, so for those of you who uh, yeah, haven't onboarded yet with the API, we do have them out here as in a re, it's in a transaction remediation guide that does need some work. Um, it's kind of an evolving um, reference uh, documentation here, but this is uh, the recharge remediation guide and some sub pages for that. Um, yeah, and. So there was, um, do we have very many? I, I heard a couple of my API friends out there, but um, I heard, I think Vincent and Richard and Chris Wranglis and, but are, are mo it seems like most of you might be doing the, uh, the snow tickets. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think we're mostly targeting the people that are doing manual. Yeah, so um, to, okay, I won't spot. spend any time on this other topic then. That's that's something just for the API group. Uh, okay. Oh, so um, I, I did, we, we have a recharge uh, Slack channel, but because Slack is no longer going to be, uh, you know, paid for, we're going to go to the free version and basically defeatured for us in many ways. I went ahead today and I cl created a ESR recharge community and um, that, that's here, um, which I will also put out here. I haven't put everybody that was in the Slack in there yet. Um, and I will definitely post this out here now. But because, you know, we can help each other and obviously IT can help you where we can. So um, in some cases I've seen some folks answer each other's questions in the API community before ITS even got got to them. <clears throat> so I posted that out there. So feel free to join that. We also have these office hours. Uh, the PPM is Fridays at 1030. I'll be attending those now. And uh, there's this uh, chart of accounts, general ledger and PPM capital. So it'd be the PPM capital and general projects portion of that uh, on Mondays at one o'clock would take you there. Um, yeah. Any other questions? We're at uh, seven minutes before the end of the time. Yeah, I've got one. Uh, this yeah. is Stephen. Hey, Kurt. Oh, hey, Stephen. Um, we have noticed some um, project task combos that existed on July 1st don't seem to be in existence anymore. And I thought I heard Stuart say at the beginning of the presentation that projects would never go away. But is That's that true for tasks? Are the ones that you're seeing that went away, were they weirdo non-standard task names? Um, but we have no, th those, I expected to, those that I reported yeah. on, I expected to see go away, but we're finding others. And one of okay. them that we pointed out, the customer put it back. You don't have that handy, again. do you? Oh, sorry. Sorry? Did it go away again after the customer put it back? Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, I haven't looked. That one wasn't one that I had noticed, so it wasn't one that I was um, working on. And I'll probably not get back to this problem in the next. Probably get back to this problem maybe next week or the week following and try and get an actual list. But um, what, it's curious as to whether or not if tasks can go away. But they shouldn't. I mean, they're never going to be deleted. What's your, is the report that you're pulling only for an active ones, perhaps? Uh, no, we pull everything. We get it from the API, so it's supposed to just be a full dump of everything. And we're not. Yeah, I don't know what that is. But we're that's not a, if you can find some, put in a ticket, that'd be terrific. Okay. Yeah. And is there a difference in, so if you had a project and task without a funding source, is that a different record than a project and a task, same project and task number, but with a funding source? Um, that's kind of a trick question. So projects have a type. If that project type is a sponsored project, 
that it should always have a funding source supplied or else you can't do anything with it with the way we've configured Oracle. Okay, so, so if you have a project that has a funding source, it should always have a funding source or a project number that has a funding source, it should always have a project or a funding source for that project number. I believe we have found several where um, the, there's a project task with blank funding source and the same project task with various funding sources. Um, I think we found several of those and we've also found a record where originally there's a project task with no funding source, but now there's a project task with a funding source. That's the reason why I asked if, the, is that a different record or is that the same record somebody finally added a funding source to it? The latter. That, that's people coming back and doing cleanup for a condition that shouldn't have existed in the first place. Okay. But your way to verify this is always just to look at the project type. If the project type is sponsor project, you should always be getting a funding source. Okay. I'll probably get back to this in a, in a couple of weeks. I'm, we're just finishing up uh, invoices. And uh, so I'm going to go start looking at data quality next. Yes, quality is king. All right, thank just, you. Yep. And we'll be looking to improve resources like the uh, remediation guide. Um, I th I'd like to get your feedback uh, either from this forum here as well as through the uh, the Teams channel and uh, about where you can see some improvements. I actually do owe some folks a few answers. I was actually uh, quite pleased and interested to see the nature of some of the questions that came in before the, uh, the session here today. And I actually didn't get to some of them and I apologize for that. Um, I do know one of them was about, well, what happens if you have to make corrections? And the simple answer is, if you've imported a batch of, of, of costs that you need to reverse out, you essentially import the, again with the opposite sign. So negatives become positives, positives become negative. Um, you use the same original transaction reference and you definitely put Y straight down that column all the way of the unmatched negative. And then that will literally offset um, the original imports that you did and then you can then import the corrections if you want. But you would really only do that sort of in mass, I think, if you had a big problem. Or you could even do it one off, I suppose. But yeah, that, that was one item that I hadn't covered in the formal materials that I wanted to bring up that, that uh, one person asked about. OK, we're at 328. Anything from anybody else? Yeah, it's Mike. I had a question in the chat. So I learned, I had to step away at another call. So I missed most of it. And I look forward that this is going to be posted so I can watch it. But uh, so I know we need a document entry call information in there and I don't have that for myself. And I know I, Stuart said, put a trouble ticket in. Um, I wonder what, what do I put in that trouble ticket and, and what to say so they know to give me the right documentary or you guys do. So, and which ticket do I put that in there? Okay. Yeah, actually, uh, did, did you put that in the chat already, um, Stuart? I, and I'm not familiar with the one that you submit just to get a document entry. Yeah. Hey, hey, was that, are you still with us? What, what do they need to do to find out their document entry? Um, they can reach out to us. Uh, sometimes it's, a, it's already there. Or just send a so he's I'm sorry. So the, if they if they reach out to you via snow, yes. what should they put in the ticket? Um, just just the document and the charge, or and we'll 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 respond. Because sometimes even if you uh, submit an MCI file, uh, we can find it and we can we can actually enter that and change it, but we can also provide it in that case. So, hey, Lizette, so, hmm. do, we, do we actually have like a page like this for the folks that are doing the snow process? I, I just, I'm, I'm maybe not caught up on that because this is too much for the, I mean, certainly the folks doing snow, this, they could benefit from looking here at this page, but as far as like, what are the basic mechanics of, of getting up and running? Yeah, at least we, initially. Can add, we can add that on the KDA, just add that uh, the document source just to look for it. So I'll make a note and then I think 
uh, we have it in, I think it, we have it on the collab page, but we just need to put all that in there. So okay. I, I'll work on that. Uh, I'll make sure there's a document for information out there. Okay. okay. Just to clarify, just to close the loop on this, what did, do I need to provide other than to ask for a documentary? Um, what do I need to let provide in my ticket so you know that should I be looking for codes from my ACI, MCI file or just my name or uh, just curious what I've got to provide in that ticket to make sure I get the right document. So, so right now you put in UCSD manual import, right? And then the recharge and then the just include, uh, you need the document entry. So I think it's on the, on the PowerPoint. So it's where that says HDH. So we, if you can just uh, let us know that you need the document entry and we already know from there. Would that help? It's essentially a description of your service that's unique um, for your recharge area. Um, Got it. Yep. And, and Michael, um, in fact, we should probably include a copy of this out there somewhere in collab. But, um, you know, just to give you a sense of what these look like, uh, this is an, well, this is an older report, sorry. Um, let's see here. Yeah, this is not very clean. I, I'm, I don't really want to share this, sorry. But there, there's a report I can, we can run periodically. Oh, that's all the way from June. That's why that's no good. Okay. Um, yeah, I thought I had one that was uh, newer than that. Apologize for that. Just, but, a, really, um, just a really quick check in on time. We are yep. uh, about two minutes over. Yep. Um, so Thank for those you. of you that have to jump into other meetings, I just wanted to let you know. Um, those of you who wish to stay, I think Kurt is continuing the discussion. Now. I, I'm willing to stay for a bit, definitely. Okay. Uh, this is uh, so for document entry. I'll need, I'll need not just my department, right? I'll need the other department that's getting recharged as well. Um, yes, and well, everybody gets a document <laughs> entry. Oh gosh, that was terrible. Um, the department recharges a lot of it. Um, with the extension, we recharge a lot of different departments. How would I get all those document entries? Do I have to ask them, or is there? A, a, You're putting in your document, entry, not their. It's, it's right. for the service you provide. Yeah. Okay. So, like, if it's a two, you know, so the example I saw in the previous screen is like a two liner. So I'll just put it on mine. I could leave the other one blank. No, you're putting doc your document entry on every line. Oh, okay. All right. That makes it simple. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. It, it helps drive, uh, you know, the transaction processing, the, you know, uh, even I think it even influences the accounting, but um, yeah, document entry name here, and so you can see Animal Care. Um, they they have their own document. Okay, and, could you um, the font a little bit larger? It's hard to. Yeah, see. no, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for uh, bringing that up. That's fair. Ooh, too big. Yeah, some of these I'm gonna just go ahead and uh, hide because it's it's just noise. Oops. Uh, hide. Okay. So let me uh, do this better. Now see here, the, the documentary has to be unique for each and every one here. Now animal care, they definitely, I think they have the record. So if we have and, any and animal the, care people here, you've got the record. But go ahead. Uh, so so the, the document entry most closely relates to a recharge facility. And mm -hmm. the reason animal care has so many of these is because they have so many separate recharge facilities. And so if you are a unit um, or a group that is recharging many other uh, units on campus, but you only have a single recharge facility, you would only need a single document entry. There you go. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you can see that this uh, chemistry group here, they don't have very many. And you can see how there's, uh, you know, makes a lot of sense, fabrication and whatnot. Not that I know much about that group, but um, yeah. So, and some of these didn't follow uh, the greatest convention early on. We were kind of evolving, but, you know, catering, housing and dining, you know, they have, this is pretty clear cut here. This pretty much lines with their services that they have. So this gives you a flavor and everyone in this column has to be unique. So even if you wanted one called SoFi, you couldn't have that. You'd have to have SoFi-2 or something uh, because they have to be unique with the way that uh, Oracle works. I'm just putting this up so you can get a flavor of what this looks like. RMP, they've had some fun with it, but you know, look at all the services that they provide. That, does that help uh, clarify it a bit, what that's about? Yes. Okay, and I'll provide this report to you. Alpha. I'm sorry, who was that that was speaking? Okay, Michael, okay, I got you. First, also, if I may add, um, all the recharge should be approved recharge for sustainability too. So not everybody can um, request unless there are approved recharge facilities. You mean I can't set up my own recharge unit on campus and just do what I want? <laughs> I, don't know what, I don't know what service I would provide, but yeah, I, I hear you. Yeah, that, that's a very valid point, Lizette. Let's see, Lizette works in accounting. She's here to keep us honest. Hi, Kurt. This is Tessine again. I have yep. a question for you since you're, you've kindly uh, stayed a little bit after session. Um, the question is about the unmatched negative transactions. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that if you are putting in a credit that you need to have a Y in that field. Yes. But is there any harm in putting a Y in every field, no. whether it's a debit or a credit? No harm at all. Okay. Thank yep. you. You're fine with that. Makes it easier if you do it that way. And yeah. I think I mentioned earlier the uh, this thing called the MCI Builder, for those folks that are using the API, actually does that. Now, I thought it was a problem, and then I found out later it was okay. So even I had a little head fake done on me, and I'd been around the application for a little bit. So it happens. Anything else? Did you guys mention the revenue expenditure type at all in the presentation? I don't remember. That can be an area of confusion I've noticed. Oh, you're, you're okay. So uh, yeah, I, I'm sure that uh, you, you covered it, right? Um, Ms. Um, sorry, Mr. McMacken, but um, yeah. Is that the part that got left out? Um, what was the question? Oh, I was just trying to remember if you guys covered the revenue expenditure type because I've seen confusion around that. Yeah, uh, the, cur the the slides that we didn't have there but that I had to add. Yeah, we did cover it, Rich. We didn't get into the, the weeds on, but I did cover it. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think that's one thing that kind of th threw me off early on is the uh, the fact that you have to flip flop the. Uh, the expenditure type and make it opposite of the line you're on of, uh, the, of who's getting charged versus the debit and credit. Anyway, I'm not really explaining that well. I'm probably confusing people more by talking. So actually, I have another question. So Stuart, in your part of the presentation, you had mentioned that I think I heard you say that every recharge facility has a different expenditure type, but I don't understand how that fits in with the debit being 770000 for every one and then 775000 for every credit. So could you so explain all of a little further? When you look at the name of an expenditure type, remember that one account code can have many different expenditure types. So when you look at the expenditure type, they all start with the name of the account, with the number of the account code. So all of those expenditure types can all map to the same account. Okay, so basically it starts with the account code, which is the same across all recharge facilities, but then the words after the account code are all different. That's correct. Okay, thank you. No problem.
Okay. Yeah, that you were saying that the uh, the account could be you could see the account multiple times over here, right? There's the expenditure type name. Okay. Any other questions? Well, I don't have a question. I just have a general comment. I just feel like these MCIs are run very professionally, very organized, and formations out there. Um, and I just wanted to compliment the team on this. Um, wish uh, everything um, worked as uh, like this as well. As well. So some good part. part I could tell that I working this stuff out ahead of time. So that's really good to hear. Okay. Anything else? I won't mind ending on that positive note. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, y'all. We really appreciate your time and your attention and your patience. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. And so accordingly, you. you can look at it again later. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody. Join the Teams channel. <laughs>